Hash chesh eskol. It is good we are together. We acknowledge that we are on the indigenous land of the Coast Salish peoples who have reserved treaty rights to this land, including the Duwamish, Duh Duabsh, Suquamish tribe, Duh Akwabsh, Muckleshoot Indian tribe, Buckleshoot, and Snoqualmie Indian tribe, Stokwabu. We thank these caretakers of this land who have lived and continue to live here since time immemorial. And we thank you for taking the time to know and understand the true history of this place and to practice allyship in taking care of these shared lands. In good health. Hoi. Hello, friends. Welcome to the uh, Seattle 47th Seattle International Film Festival. My name is Dustin Casper. I'm a uh, uh, programmer for the, the festival as well as the educational programs manager year round for SIF. And welcome to our first of uh, several festival forums. This one is Kin Theory, Indigenizing Film Industry Spaces. And uh, before we begin, I wanna give a huge shout out to our friends at Nia Taro for, uh, for their support throughout the festival, uh, but especially for, uh, for arranging and engaging this, uh, this extraordinary panel and, uh, and for a solid amount of the work we're gonna be discussing on this, uh, on this panel today as well. I am really, really excited to, uh, to introduce Tracy Rector, who is uh, not just a festival programmer with SIF, but an extraordinary artist, uh, curator, filmmaker, and uh, all around extraordinary human to, uh, to take the panel away. Tracy, welcome. Hey, everybody. Happy Saturday. Um, and thank you, Dustin and Sif, for 15 years um, of just incredible support of Indigenous peoples in cinema. Uh, welcome, everybody. Today's virtual event at the Seattle International Film Festival, our 47th annual one, um, is really about a conversation together um, about indigenizing film spaces. Um, we are inspired in this moment of time of great industry um, reflection and changes and thinking about, you know, how do we as um, industry peoples support one another, be good allies and think about moving forward in a better way that's more inclusive of all people, specifically of indigenous voices. This event is brought to you by the Seattle International Film Festival, Nia Taro, um, and with the um, contributions of Sundance Institute. Um, we at Nia Taro are currently underway in creating a database called Kin Theory. And it's a collective opportunity to bring together indigenous voices in the creative industries um, to network, but also to be um, visible to industry professionals. The goal of Kin Theory is really, again, just to foster community and other media makers while increasing hiring opportunities and collaborations in global media. We prioritize indigenous peoples and actively seek to build coalition with other artists in the global majority, including black, Latinx, Asian, and other people of color, as well as people who are undocumented, femme, trans, non-binary, LGBTQIA, um, and people with disabilities. We look forward to building a new way of working in a changing world while showcasing and creating community for indigenous screen storytellers. While the database is being developed, we are hosting these series of virtual events um, with other media industry folks, other BIPOC kin and non-BIPOC accomplices to discuss the ways in which we can create coalition within and across communities to support indigenous creators and the work. And one of my favorite things to do is how can we start creating new systems as well. A little bit about me, I'm the Managing Director of Storytelling at Nia Taro, a global nonprofit based in Seattle, Washington, Coast Salish Territories, that uplifts Indigenous, that strive to uplift 
uplift Indigenous peoples and their land stewardship through policy and storytelling. Niatera is a sponsor of the Seattle International Film Festival this year. Um, and we're just so excited to be in conversation today. And thank you once again for um, your intro and for playing the land acknowledgement, Dustin. All right. Well, now let's get to our conversation with our special guest. Um, I would like to ask you, Aneta, to introduce yourself. Hi. Um, I was. I'm a little nervous because I'm. I'm so used to being behind the scenes um, on the operational sides of these panels. But I see a lot of um, familiar names in the chat, so I'd like to say aloha kako and uh, kia orana to to everyone. Uh, my name is Yanata Le'i and I'm the senior manager for the Sundance Indigenous Program. Um, I am from Wailua, Hawaii, and I'm currently in Los Angeles um, on Tongva lands. And just want to say thank you to Tracy, Yatero, and Sif for having us. Thank you, Yanata. Uh, now it's your turn, Adam. Please uh, share a little bit about yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm Adam Prone. I am the Associate Director of the Indigenous uh, Program at Sundance Institute. I'm uh, Kaiwa Mohawk, and I'm calling in from Riverside, California, which is uh, Kahuya land. And uh, yeah, I also am um, one of the co-founders of uh, Cousin, which is a collective um, dedicated to supporting Indigenous filmmakers working in uh, more of the experimental space, but also kind of like pushing the different boundaries of uh, of genre and, and just the, the format itself. Right on. Well, to uh, get us into the mood, because I'm also a little bit nervous too, you know, I'm, <laughs> I like being on the other side. So <laughs> I hear you. Um, I was just reflecting on the ways in which our community is pretty small. And um, if you all recall how we initially met, um, and I'm just yeah. keeping my uh, mute, myself unmuted so we can just have a conversation too. Yeah, I think, um, so for me, um, I think Adam, the first time I, I, I laid eyes on Adam Perone was in, in Honolulu. I think it was a Honolulu Museum of Art and they had, uh, Sundance had come down to Hawaii and they were doing a shorts, I think they were doing a shorts tour and then like doing um, like a, a session um, for filmmakers down there. So I just, yeah. What was that? It was like a workshop, yeah. Yeah, and so that's I think that's the first time I remember meeting Adam and then Tracy. I remember when I when I started at Sundance, I remember seeing your name um, as our alumni, and then also I think I met you finally in person at the producer creative producer summit, um, maybe two three years ago um, at Sundance, which was an amazing experience. I I remember feeling comfortable putting both steak and dessert on my plate and sitting <laughs> next to you <laughs> just being like this is who I am <laughs> yeah. um, that, that's how we roll <laughs> authenticity all around at buffets during film festivals everything <laughs> <laughs> I think that's um like so key to this conversation is just being in community and being um natural around each other and letting go of kind of any pretenses. And that's something that I hope we can, you know, infuse into this conversation, but also just um, in our collective thinking of how to move forward at this point in time and creating new systems in the industry. Definitely. I'm curious how, Adam, were you were you working for the program when Tracy was a, a fellow at Center? I don't think like officially, I think I, the first time I met Tracy was, I think when you, it was either when you were at the the native lab back in the day, or it was at the festival after that. It was like one of the two. Um, but yeah, no, I think back then I was just like contracting and kind of volunteering. I, I was broke, but it was like, that's kind of, uh, it's kind of that, that era of my life. But yeah, no, I think, and then, yeah, I, I've just always kind of known Tracy since then. I mean, Tracy's always been, you know, kind of a part of the scene in the community and um, you know, we always kind of bump into each other. I think like, yeah, one of the times where like, I didn't even, I mean, it was, it was very welcome, but it was like one of those things where I think we were at big sky that one year or something. And I was like, Oh, Whoa, Tracy, what's going on? <laughs> it's just, but it was nice. I mean, it's like, it's, it's cool. Cause it's, yeah, it's just kind of what you were saying. It's that community 
um, aspect of it. And, you know, we're everywhere. So. Yeah. And I remember, um, I think I remember that time at Sundance, Adam, uh, you helped us out quite a bit. And I think that's something that I just appreciate about being in community too. It's like the lack of pretense, but also just how do we help each other? Yeah, that's awesome. Um, just a heads up. <laughs> I'm not crying because I'm so happy or <laughs> Uh, Ale, I am very happy. It's allergy season here and I'm going crazy over here. So just so you know what's happening on my end. Um, all right, so let's jump into a few questions. I'm gonna start with you, Ianetta. Um, what does it mean to indigenize the film industry from your perspective? Well, I think um, that's a question that could probably take up this whole hour in answering, but um, I think it, you know, it really depends on on the person you're speaking to and you know I feel like a lot of different communities have different answers to that question but for me personally um you know when, when I think about what it means to indigenize um the film industry my personality is to just be 100% steam ahead and I um for me it felt like a race to reclaim stories and perception of indigenous people but now that I've kind of you know been um you know, in the program and kind of more in the film community um, the past few years, um, I realized that it's an ongoing process that will, you know, that will be a lifetime um, of trying to do. And um, being that I, I come from a sports background, I work in athletics uh, before I made the transition over to, to film and media, but, um, you know, we always, we're always taught and we teach our, our players to um, focus on, your strengths and focus on your game versus focusing on um, any outside entities or, you know. And so for me, I think indigenizing um, the film industry is more about working on your art, your practice versus trying to prove something to other people. Um, and I think, you know, just challenging your own process and finding um, ways that work for our communities and making things for us um, and allowing other people to be privy to that art. Um, to me, that's what, you know, indigenizing film would look like in my world. Why, um, why do you think Sundance has made such a enormous commitment to changing these dynamics? And yeah, I think, um, and it's something Adam, you can add to as well, but I know it's, it's always been part of our, our origin story. Um, as some people might know, you know, our, our founder, um, Robert Redford, um, back in the day, um, when he was starting the Institute, realized that, um, and it's a, it's a much more fun story, but realized that the, um, the industry needs Indigenous people to tell their own stories. I believe he was tapped on to play a, a Native American, and he realized that, hey, that's not kosher. Um, let's let's find a way to, to help Indigenous people tell their own stories, act in their own movies. Um, and so I think, you know, being that it is our program has been part of, of the Institute from the very beginning, I think that's kind of, you know, helped that someone um, back then before it was even trendy um, mm. realized and recognized how important it is to have authentic voices and stories. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you for that, Adam. Yeah, no, I, I kind of just going off of the thing with Redford. Yeah, it was something, you know, with how he had been working in Westerns kind of with what Neto was saying. And, you know, he'd been asked to, um, to play indigenous parts, but I think it was sort of his whole, his whole thing as well too, kind of around that time where, uh, you know, he wasn't able to really find, he was asking around, but he wasn't able to find any indigenous storytellers like within the industry itself. Um, but, um, but it's interesting though, too, because it's like also like around that same time too, there were indigenous filmmakers that were making things, but it was more kind of like, out of um a lot of people kind of came from more of a, an activist background so it was like a lot of sort of like that period like right after um uh kind of between the occupation of alcatraz and like even the um even like what happened with wounded knee later on but like there were a lot of people there that the same it was from a similar sort of standpoint but also kind of like really sort of identifying what the film industry had done and what that had sort of how it sort of had rested uh 
control of just sort of like the, the indigenous image, so to speak, and uh, a lot of the representation from indigenous people. So it's, you know, they started making documentaries and things like that. And in a lot of ways, that was sort of something that was happening at the same time. And then by the time like Redford kind of like was able to identify stuff, it's like you had some people that were kind of already in that space that he's able to pull into. Um, so within the context of Sundance, yeah, it's like we've been doing this for about 40 years um, since the founding of the Institute. Um, we've been formalized. It was like an initiative before, but we've been formalized as a program for about the last uh, 20 years. So. Yeah, I remember one of those early filmmakers, Sandy Osawa, who's from mm -hmm. the Maka Nation. Um, and uh, we're lucky that she's here in the Pacific Northwest and she's just such a hero in so many ways. But it's interesting, I first really came to know her name through the list of alumni who had films at Sundance. Yeah. Um, and it makes me think about kind of the power and responsibility of having these platforms, but also it, I've been reflecting on you know, we're in this pandemic and what are the ways that we can transform our platforms and our spaces, um, but also think about the new opportunities that can come from the changes, you know, in the festivals and the, um, and the way people are seen and heard, especially indigenous makers. And I'm curious if you have some thoughts on this, Adam. In terms of, uh, can you repeat that again, just in terms of like creating new platforms? Is that what you were kind of saying? Yeah, I was just thinking a little bit about the changes in how festival runs have occurred during the pandemic and um, how this may or may not impact indigenous creators. And I was thinking about, you know, those initial days, it was just how to be found um, mm -hmm. and really making headway. But then now it's, um, we're in this strange space of, are we looking at equalizing the playing field again? Or are we- Yeah. Do we have an opportunity? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's interesting because I think that there's like, I think that there's a lot of opportunity to, to a certain extent. It's a lot easier, I think, now to get uh, like an audience or at least just like, you know, eyeballs on on different works because, you, you know, with a lot of festival and it depends on the festival, too. But like, you know, with a lot of festivals, when it comes to shorts, like given everything with the pandemic and stuff like that, like some of the stuff's already been online. So like, that's one way to kind of help sort of spread awareness around some of that and kind of going from there. Um, and it's also, it's interesting too, just because, you know, with festivals, I mean, even like now with, you know, with, with SIF and other festivals, it's like they are going for something that's an all kind of digital approach with this past year or, and they're going to be moving into something that's a bit more hybrid going forward. So, so it's interesting because I think that there's like, a lot of space to kind of try to figure out your own thing to a certain extent. Um, I know like at least with my work with cousin, um, like, we, you know, I, we were working, I was working with like the other co-founders and stuff like that. And we, we put together this program called uh, cycle zero, which was um, kind of a lot of like, it was a, a collection of works that were not commissioned by us, but by the artists that we had commissioned. Uh, it was like their previous work, but um yeah, I mean, that was something that, I mean, looking back, it, I mean, it, it was kind of crazy because it was like, we had made our selections and like, right before we made the announcement, we we're like, hey, what if we just did this one thing? Like, everybody's locked in, you know, in their homes and stuff. And so like, what if we just like streamed our own thing, just to test it out to see like, if we, you know, if we get any eyeballs and like, build, uh, you know, some excitement around the work of that these people are doing. And yeah, I mean, like, we're still playing a bunch of festivals we just did uh, a program at um at moma for doc Fortnite. uh we um we're, there's a kind of an ongoing thing that's going on until july with the san francisco cinematech um there's a couple others that are on deck we have a next not this coming monday but the monday after that we have another version of the cycle zero program that's playing at red cat as well too so um but i mean like you know that's just an example of something where like that I don't think that something like that could have probably existed before the pandemic, uh, at least in that in that format and in terms of like that much attention. But I mean, you know, one of the things as well, too, I mean, I, um, you know, clearly like with our work at Sundance, you know, there's a lot of um, focus and a lot of advocacy for changing the industry as it as it should change and, you know, making more space for indigenous people. 
Um, but that's also with that in mind too, that also doesn't necessarily mean that you also can't make your own space, so to speak, you know, and try to carve that out just with how, like just the amount of disruption that's going on to everything now, I think this past year has really brought like, whether it's been the film industry or like anything period, it's brought everything into question and like how things can be different and how you can, um, in a lot of ways, just try to do your own thing and see if, you know, you get people to pay attention and, and, uh, and if anything, it's just like your own space that you can kind of keep building out, you know, but, um, but yeah, so it's like, yeah, it's kind of, I guess, to your question too, it's like, it's, it's both creating space within the industry because there is so much change going on, like, especially in the last couple of years since Standing Rock, uh, the indigenous program at Sentence has been like, we, we've been hit up a lot about, um, you know, people looking for indigenous stories, indigenous artists, um, and, uh, and then, you know, and then again, too, even just in terms of like cre- kind of creating your own space, because I think one of the big things that this um, with festivals, like going going online, where I mean, you've seen like Imaginative do that. Sundance has done the same thing, too. But um, I think it creates a new level of access to this work um, uh, to indigenous communities that might otherwise not be able to attend a, f- a film festival in person or, you know, make that travel. So um, and yeah, it's just it's it's really interesting. Just I think, you know. All in all, I think it's just kind of around like creating a certain level of awareness, whether it is around representation or whether it's just like letting people know that, you know, there's work out there for people to see. So, yeah, the connections have been interesting that are forming. You know, we just started this um, classroom initiative and we had, um, or kind of an online, you know, master class and our first. Um, a featured guest was Kara Lacey. And we had an entire classroom from Fiji join. And they were Tongans, Samoans, Ratumans. And they are learning because of the pandemic. You know, they're taking on how to do storytelling, digital storytelling. And so they saw this online and they had that opportunity or that ability to tap in. It was just kind of mind blowing, but I'm seeing more of those types of relationships form too. Um, well, thank you both. Um, and shifting over into community building, um, Neda, I'm thinking about uh, coalition building that's extended mm-hmm. um, across other communities who are not often heard from. Um, and just thinking about how, you know, the work in indigenizing spaces um, can uplift and be, uh, I guess, an ally too, to Mm -hmm. other underserved communities. Yeah, I think just kind of going off your last comment, like about, you know, Kiara being able to reach um, a classroom in Fiji. To me, that's super exciting. And that's kind of what inspires me, like just being able to connect different, not indigenous, not specifically just indigenous communities, but other marginalized communities. And that kind of makes me think of, you know, like every year we go to Berlin All, um, you know, the International Film Festival in Berlin, and we're able to have um, just a cohort of Indigenous organizations from around the world come together as part of what used to be known as our Native Stand. And it's exciting because Nia Taro has also joined us, you know, in the past couple of years as well. But um, just to be able to come together, you know, from different parts of the world. So we have like, you know, the um, Sami, uh, we have, you know, like Waii, we have just, you know, people from everywhere, the Pacific, to come in, come together in one space, but also just be focused on one thing. To me, that's like, it's just super exciting to think that even though we're from different places in the world and we're working on different films and different languages, we're all still working towards the same thing. Um, and just to have more representation in, in film and media um, and to help um, also develop, like filmmakers develop and help teach um, filmmaking skills um so to me like like I said like just seeing also like the fresh and new creative um work coming out of these communities is amazing I mean just thinking about all of the the amazing films that have come out of you know our LGBTQI communities or our you know Asian American communities Pacific Islander communities um Native American communities you know it's just it's refreshing and especially this year where I feel a lot of the the hard work um, that, you know, our director Bird, Running Water, has done behind the scenes, along with 
other allies like, you know, you, Heather Ray, um, Illuminatives, and just seeing that all come to head this year and seeing, um, you know, a lot of these TV shows that are about to launch soon, like, um, with like Sierra Arnales, Sterling Harjo, like to me, that's just, I have, I have goosebumps um, uh, because yeah, it's just the culmination of all that hard work um, finally coming to fruition. Um, but yeah, I think, yeah, that's it. That was probably way off topic, but you got me, you got me all wound oh. up, Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I feel you. I get chicken skin too. And I think about yeah. what's happening in this moment in time. I think, was it just yesterday? Sterling was the first shooting day. Yeah. And it was like seeing people like Sydney fly into Tulsa and Tasba. And yeah, I'm just thinking about this broad global coalition too with Taika mm -hmm. as part of it. And um just, you know, you brought up like with Wiley Nation, I know they're doing a lot of work around kind of collaboration work around mm -hmm. the world too. And a lot of that's influenced from these other spaces like ADOC and, mm -hmm. um, and the Black Star and Firelight. And so it just seems like everybody's really being generous and feeding into each other right now. Um, yeah, definitely. And I think it's, you know, when it boils down to it, it's about challenging like the systems that were historically created for this like Hollywood monolith. Um, and I think out of that has come so much amazing creativity that it's not just about like indigenizing the space anymore. It's about actually creating, you know, content for the world and stuff that's universally exciting to everyone. Um, yeah. Um, Adam, um, I know that you've been doing some work with Black Star, and I um, I've been really inspired personally as someone who's multicultural, um, just with like what that kind of collaboration, co-organizing in industry spaces looks like. Can you talk a little bit about that work and what you see happening? Yeah. Um so I, I'm on the editorial advisory board for the publication that they do called Scene. Um, and it's a, um, I should say it's like, it's really, it's more kind of around film writing. Um, I mean, there is some like non-film art in there as well, but it's mostly sort of focused on film writing and like really sort of like critical essays by uh, people of color, artists of color on, um, people of color, writers of color on like art, on like artists and filmmakers of color as well. Um, so uh, yeah, they just published their first issue a couple months ago. I know they're starting to gear up for the second one. Um, but with that one, it's interesting because it's like, yeah, I, um, I know like with their festival, you know, there's a big sort of um, like, I guess you could say sort of around their programming, they do a lot of um, both black and uh, indigenous programming of, uh, of films, but I, with the, um, publication that they have, it's really sort of focused on the critical aspect of it, but also kind of around like really kind of trying to build a community around that as well, too. Like they just recently did the William Greaves um, film seminar, which is pretty great. I got to I got to hop into that for a little bit. And same thing, uh, you know, sort of a, a film seminar that was by and for um, people of color. Um, they actually had the Cleo brothers there sort of showing one of their more, more recent works and um, and yeah, I mean, it's it, so it's been really cool for that because I, the, the, I mean, to my knowledge, there hasn't really been something, at least within the US, that's been very sort of focused and like that that's been something that's been sort of like mission driven from the beginning, so to speak. You know, I think you have a lot of organizations that that pivot as they get new leadership or things like that, but um, or as the, the times change and stuff. But yeah, with something like Black Star, it's really interesting because they've always sort of had this very sort of singular idea of what that community looks like and what type of support and what type of work that they they want out there so um yeah check out scene uh go buy a go buy a copy if you want so um so it's really interesting to me do you feel that there's a difference in bipoc allyship versus say white allyship and yeah i think i've seen it i mean mostly around like i think some of the discussions that happen like when it comes to film Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously shared histories around a lot of things, both within film and outside of that as well. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think that there's like, I don't want to say like an insider type view, but it's like, I don't know. There's something where it, like you can be like, 
it's there's a lot less kind of explaining so to speak um or having to sort of explain your own identity in some ways like i think that um if anything it's just it, when i've been a part of those conversations they tend to be a lot more of kind of both the craft but also like you know what does it mean to engage with certain images and um and things like that so yeah i think about um conversations i've been part of as well and just kind of looking at moving you know past through and acknowledging historical traumas in different ways and what that looks like in storytelling um and then BIPOC spaces, how that looks and feels very different. Um, and that there's this, um, there's a joy aspect too that I'm hearing. I think that's a huge part of it too, because I think that there's, I think maybe more when it's like maybe non POC allyship versus that, like there tends to be a little bit more of a focus on not always, but I mean, I, you know, I think a lot of those conversations tend to lean a little bit more towards trauma and things like that, um, or at least from a historical standpoint and cultural standpoint. But I think, you know, when it, when the dynamics changed a little bit, I think that there's a lot because there's so much less explaining you kind of have to do. Um, mm -hmm. I think that there's a lot more of kind of an opening for, um, you know, what does it mean to sort of explore certain things of joy or like not necessarily having to explain or try to correct you know issues within your own community or history and stuff i mean that's something i i mean i've i've, I've kind of gotten in trouble a couple times like sort of like proposing this but like you know it's like one of those things like sometimes with indigenous filmmakers um not all of them but like you know just kind of like and i don't ask this in a confrontational way it's more kind of like a prompt that i've used with some stuff with sundance but the idea of like what would it look like what kind of film or what kind of story would you tell if like tomorrow, all of a sudden you're, um, you know, all of the issues, both historical and societal and cultural, like we're, um, we're like, we're already taken care of, or like they were solved or something like that, you know? And um, that's not to say like to ignore any of that, but it's more just kind of like, what is your voice outside of like trying to process trauma or like, are you able to move away from trauma? You know, like, what does that look like? Um, and I think kind of opening that door, I think, for some people, because I think it's just with film in general, I think, and it's also kind of, I think, to the point of allyship or um, whether it's Black and Indigenous or whoever else, I think that there's always, you know, I mean, th th it's all like really heavy stuff. And I think, but I think, and it's, you know, it's stuff that we do need to like keep figuring out and figuring out how how can we solve some of this, but also like, you know, you're allowed to be, like joyful about your own experience and you're allowed to do something that has nothing to do like that you know i mean sure of course there's always going to be the sort of the politics or the the um the meaning of like what does it mean for a person of color to make a film and stuff you know but i think also like you can just make like a goofy stoner comedy if you want and <laughs> like you know you can make a romantic comedy i mean you can do like i don't know like you can do whatever else and it's like it's not saying that like you're erasing or not thinking or not acknowledging that stuff but it's also like i mean you're allowed to explore other things you know what i mean like i think and i think that this is also the thing as well too there's always with I think a lot of the like a lot of these films that are out there, and I think it's like you know I'm I'm not like blaming the filmmakers or anything like that because again, too everybody sort of deals with a lot of this stuff in their own way, but I mean there also is um, if there's like not a lot of questioning, I think there's the and this is more of kind of like a harder kind of film theory and critical type way of thinking of it, but it's like when you do engage with images of trauma or like recreations and stuff like that, what does that mean? You know, I mean, are you like essentially re-traumatizing your own community, you're re-traumatizing like audiences and also like, you know, I mean, it's by re by putting this out there, are you kind of like doing the same thing over again? You know what I mean? To a certain extent in terms of like the nature of, of engaging with images like that. So, um, and again, it's not saying that we shouldn't engage with some of with some of that, but it's more just kind of the question. I think a lot of people need to ask questions why, and also kind of like, you know, like I said, to allow themselves to look at like, I don't know. Yeah. Like, what does it mean for like, I don't know, like somebody like Sky Hopinka, for example, where it's mm -hmm. like, what does it mean when it's like, you know, it's just a, you know, he's filming like landscapes and he's just, it's just kind of like, they're almost kind of like diary entries of his own travels and stuff like that. Um, 
you know, you can do something like that. And it's like, you know, you're not ignoring a lot of other things, but you know, it's just a different, it's just focusing on your own experience or trying to figure out a way to like translate to film, translate that to film in a way that like can connect an audience to your experience, but also, um, you know, not having to explain or justify who you are through a film, if that makes sense, or your own experience. So. Yeah, I think that's also part of like the excitement that I had is that we're finally in a space where we get just an array of content. And I think, you know, like how everyone refers to like the Catholic guilt, I think there's a level of like cultural or indigenous guilt when mm. when creating stories, like Adam said, like that's kind of a lot of the the talks that we have with our filmmakers, we, you know, to let them know it's okay to express your joy. It's okay to not have to explain yourself. Um you know, and so to me, that's just exciting. And, and it, you know, reflects, again, reflects the hard work that, that was done in the past where filmmakers can actually feel comfortable with exploring new, um, you know, just new formats and new new stories and um, not being so worried about, you know, having to address a lot of the hardships that go with it. Yeah, some filmmakers I'm inspired by is um, Skago Pinka for sure. Um, but I also think of um, Nicholas Gallinan, um, who's Clinkett and has done work with Shabazz Palaces. And that's part of that whole crew with Khalil Joseph, who's black, and does these just incredible moving. What's his name? I'm going to have to like, I didn't know that he was like affiliated with Khalil um, Joseph. Yeah, um, Nicholas, is that who you? Yeah, yeah, I've no, yeah, I'm not familiar with their work, so now I, I have to like look at. Okay, cool. It's in the chat. So it's in the chat. Yeah, yeah. Nicholas Gallinan, um, and he just recently got signed on by Sub Pop, and um, which I'm really excited about. And I think that there's something in the relationship that he has with Ishmael Butler, who used to be with um, Diggable Planets, who's Shabazz Palaces, who's at Sub Pop, and just these ways that BIPOC creatives right now are moving into these collective, collaborative, co-leveraging spaces, and people are um, being exactly who they want to be, which is just amazing. And the work is just kind of blowing my mind, too. <laughs> yeah, I think there's definitely like some sort of like a blossoming of work happening i think on kind of two fronts i mean definitely like on the industry front on kind of a lot of the stuff that you know you were talking about before and i think also definitely in terms of like the art world as well like i know we talked about sky or like the khalil brothers or um you know like alex alex's work as well and um yeah and, i mean just like a lot of other people out there like caroline Minet, i think of and um up in canada and and a lot of sami filmmakers as well too it's like it's cool to see yeah i mean it's it's something where i think um yeah i mean you know it's taken us a little over 100 what 120 plus years to get here but it's like it's finally kind of happening which is cool but yeah it, i mean it's an exciting time to to be in where it's i i think it's still kind of one of those things where like everybody knows something's going on i don't think that there's any sort of like authoritative stance on what that is yet you know because i think we're we're in the thick of it but um yeah i mean hopefully it it, it yeah i mean hopefully i mean i'm excited to see it even like beyond this stage like what does the next stage look like you know i mean like it's uh it's, it's pretty nuts but yeah it's cool it is um i'm gonna just take a moment to answer a few questions that i see in the q a um one of them is, and I'm just going to read it out if that's okay for everybody. Uh, Michael Kinamoto. Oh, hey, Michael. ITVS, <laughs> major supporter. Um, it's exciting to see Sky Hopinka's work on the Criterion channel in virtual theatrical screenings recently. Do you think that the pandemic has presented new opportunities to build audiences' awareness appetites for bold and experimental works specifically by Indigenous artists? That's similar to what we were just discussing. Yeah, I think so. And kind of, again, like tying into that last conversation of, you know, Adam saying, I'm excited for what's next. Um, I know, you know, when the pandemic first started, we had this great panel about, um, you know, like the digital space and experimental um, experimentalism within the film world. And I think um, the exciting thing about that and, you know, tying it into indigeneity is that, you um, 
I think it's a medium that everyone is kind of just starting off on the same platform, the same um, jumping off point. And so um, in that respect, um, our panelists had mentioned, you know, with everything else, you know, our communities have kind of been one step behind, but we're actually starting on the same playing field now. And so it's really interesting to see some of the amazing works that's coming out um, as far as, you know, like experimental work and, and digital work. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think yes. And then on top of that, too, is like, you know, we've been pushing the virtual spaces, which has been reaching so many more communities. And so there's such a great interest now, you know, and um, being that it's um, everyone's finally, you know, getting a chance to see um, and we're getting a chance to share Indigenous work where a lot of communities had no idea that, that it even existed, including myself, you know. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah, I'd say like around the to that question of sort of like, you know, is there an appetite or something for experimental work? Like, mm -hmm. I think so. But I think it's also like, I think it's an interesting time even just for experimental work, even outside of like indigenous filmmakers making it. Um, I think part of that, too, is like also just sort of the general trajectory of the I mean, TV is a little bit different, but like really more kind of the film industry where um, you know, I mean, there's not as many films being made just because so much money is being sort of focused on kind of these larger kind of like mega blockbuster type type films. And like, you know, that's not like any sort of shade towards any of the filmmakers working in that space. It's but it's more just kind of like the field has gotten much smaller to a certain extent. Um, and the and it, I mean, that industry has always been certainly kind of averse to a certain level of risk. And I think it's even more so now because there's more and more at stake. Uh, I think with a lot of the experimental stuff, I think there's has there have been a lot of I've at least noticed that at least on my end, I think that there's been a lot more people looking towards that space because it is something a lot different. Like it doesn't necessarily follow a certain formula, um, and it in some ways it's. I mean, I'm maybe sort of like overshooting this to some extent, but it's like it's almost I think in some ways similar to kind of like what American independent film was probably in the nineties um, in some ways where it, like, this is, again, this is something that's like completely outside of the system. It's, it offers sort of like bold voices and in kind of a way that's a little bit more immediate or a certain level of access is sort of there now, just given with everything with the pandemic. So um, yeah, I think it's interesting because it's like, you, you see a lot, a lot of people that, you know, they want to see what's beyond uh just sort of the main streaming sites, you know, like what, what else is out there? Like you were saying, like with the Criterion channel where they have a very high level of curation or places like movie, movie, M -U -M -U -B -I, which we've also have a, uh, a programming partnership that we did with them again this year. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah. With some indigenous shorts on there. Um, and like, you know, a couple other places as well too, but it's, it's, um, and there's like a lot of experimental film, film festivals and events that, you know, are still going on and stuff like that, like, you know, throughout the pandemic online. So it's created, I think the pandemic's created a new level of access to a lot of this work that I think beforehand, it was just kind of like, if, unless if you were in a few of kind of like the, the more like sort of major urban centers and kind of like found a pathway to a lot of that work through that. Um, it, it was always, I think in some ways it was always a lot harder to kind of access a lot of this work just because people just didn't know what was out there. But I think again too i think because there's such a dearth of like everything online and stuff like that i think it's it's created a space for people that do want to find something that's you know i, I don't want to say on the margins but like something that is outside of sort of the box of what's currently being presented i think about and it's in my mind not experimental but I do see it happening more and more is that people want to tell stories in their traditional languages and their indigenous languages. Um, and uh, I see this as part of, you know, reawakening efforts, but also just um, kind of part of that liberation we're talking about or that authenticity or that being freed up from trauma, like, wait, why does this have to be in English? Um, Neda, are you seeing this in terms of what you're seeing come through? Yeah, and I think it's super exciting, um, especially you know, after the, the big conversation around Minari, you know, and just kind of the categorization of, of a film and kind of what that means. But I was just thinking about the how I 
um, you know, kind of was first exposed to indigenous film and um, became passionate about it was, um, I forgot what year it was. Adam, do you know what year uh, Tai Sangha's Stones premiered at Sundance? Oh, oh that's so beautiful. Uh, I think it was 20, what, 2009, 2010, something like that? Yeah, so I think, you know, it was around there where I, I, I had seen it at premiere at Sundance and my first thought was like, number one, mm there's indigenous film number two, like you can do this in Hawaiian language. And I was just blown away. And that's kind of what, um, you know, got me questioning and excited about what, I, you know, what I was seeing on screen and seeing Pacific Island people was being represented um, at Sundance, you know, of all people, of all places where um, it was just such a new and exciting environment for me. But, you know, I think more and more um, there's, you know, I was talking about kind of that, um, Indigenous creators feeling that they they're in a box where they need to try to think first and foremost of the universal audience before um, who they actually are intending the film for, which is their communities. And so, um, you know, with the big push as well of revitalizing language, I think it's just a super important and um, creative expression that that's to me it's beautiful. Um, and so, yeah. That's huge, you know, and thinking about industry too, it's who are we creating films for is mm -hmm. a really big question and how that drives content, but also just choices in the industry. Yeah, and that's also part of our mission too as a program is having, you know, bringing up these indigenous filmmakers and helping them develop their films to then in turn take it back to their communities. And I think, you know, that's where we see the most... Um, where we'll see the most um, growth in, in the industry and in what we do. Thank you. I'm going to pull up another question. I really appreciate your insight, Neda. And Stones, I just, I love that. <laughs> I, I watched it so many times. Same, oh. Same. oh, yeah. And, well, and I still think about Stones, the... Um, what Ty did in shooting, and, and I don't know these technical terms because I'm so DIY, but shooting day for night or night for day, is that correct? Or, uh, yep. And so I learned that. How is that, Adam? Uh, day for night. Day yeah. for night. And I learned that from that film. And then now I see it all the time in like Netflix movies. And I always think of Stones because of that, because that's a director's choice that Ty made. And I feel really excited about that. <laughs> it's a whole um, other panel yeah <laughs> um the skill and innovation oh my god um so another question can you explain how the SIF land acknowledgement came about um that's something that we produced at Neotero in partnership with the Snoqualmie tribe um and it was so important to have language in that so McKenna from the tribe um narrated and wrote that script so I answered that live. Um, you know, we're coming up close to time. Um, I just realized, uh, and I do see that there's a question from Michelle who, um, and this might be a really nice way to end. So who's inspiring you right now? What work do you have your eye towards? What creative? Adam could spend a week on this one, but I'll let you go <laughs> first, Adam. <laughs> Uh, you mean like indigenous or just like non-indigenous or just anything or let's go for joy yeah what's bringing you joy what's bring what's inspiring you right now in general yeah uh i have to think about that a little bit like i've been so busy i haven't had time to think about joy yet so <laughs> like i think <laughs> <laughs> No, honestly, I mean, I'm going, so I'm going to, I, yeah, I'm going to, uh, got like, a. am actually going on like a mini vacation to the, later today. So that's, that will be like my joy. That's like the first time I've kind of done that in the whole past year. So looking forward to that. But I think I'm like, I've been, yeah, I mean, I, I've been like researching a lot on different things. I mean, just kind of my thing. I mean, just coming from a curation background a lot, like, I mean, mostly with some of my work at LACMA, which is like looking a lot more at kind of like film history and stuff. Um, yeah, I've been really sort of fascinated with this, this uh, tidbit that I heard about um, 
originally from Adam Khalil. And it's like been this, this thing where I'm like, I'm hoping to connect with this one guy that has like a bunch of information on it. But like in the 19, early 1950s, like late 1940s, there, these, there's this group of, uh, of uh, indigenous actors in, in Hollywood that were trying to like literally form their own tribe um, called the, the DeMille Indians, like, cause they had all worked with Cecil B. DeMille. And so like, it was like this weird thing where they like wanted to name their tribe after him and like honor of him. And so it's like this really bizarre kind of sort of forgotten history thing. And there's a lot of questions obviously about like, you know, <laughs> like, I think just in terms of now how that like probably hasn't aged super well, but it's like a really fascinating, fascinating idea just to think of like that there were these people that were involved in film that wanted to kind of like form a new tribe to a certain extent that was based around an identity around that, which is, which is interesting because it's also kind of like, you know, yeah, why wouldn't there be like another tribe? There are always like new tribes kind of being formed and stuff, I think, you know, at a certain point. And um, even though like, I think that in much, much more ways, I kind of look at that history as a little bit more from kind of a, a humorous standpoint. It's just, it's been something I've been thinking about a lot, which is, um, which is, yeah, it's just, it's such a bizarre kind of story. So that's brought me joy. I think if that makes sense. So. It does. Thank you. Neta? Yeah, I think um, just seeing, like, you know, seeing um, festivals programming amazing films is bringing me joy. Like right now, I know um, Sif is is going to be showing Waikiki, um, you know, Christopher Kuhunahana's uh, directorial debut, this feature. And so I think, you know, to me, that's amazing. Um, anything that Kiara Lacey puts out, um, I know out of state, her feature documentary is going to be um, premiering on the, not premiering, but it's going to be on the World Channel tonight. Um, and I just love, you know, the connection and the the poetry that she she has in her filmmaking. She also had This Is The Way We Rise that premiered at Sundance, um, which, which is showing on the circuit right now. Um, as far as like joy, joy in films, kind of going along with the, um, the theme of our conversation today, I think, you know, of course, Taika Waititi, um, Eagle vs. Shark. Shark is one of my favorite films because um, that was the first time I was able to see, you know, like a mainstream feature by an Indigenous person with Indigenous people just be silly. Um, it's like the Napoleon Dynamite of, of the Maori. Um, and also uh, the, the great television shows that are coming out right now. Like I know Tazba Chavez um, is working on Resident Alien, which is just such a like hilarious show that um, incorporates indigeneity, but in such a subtle and natural way that it's, you know, it, I think it's, it's just awesome how they can do that. And I'm, um, you know, I'm certain that's, that's what's going to happen as you see, um, these, these new television shows and episodics right, uh, rolling out. Um, and then also I'm excited for you guys, because I know you will be brought joy, um, by the, the projects that are in development right now. Like we just, um, had our first wrap up of, our partnership with the Blacklist, um, you know, called the Indigenous List in partnership with Bloom and Natives and uh, the, the scripts and the material that is coming out of our Indigenous creators is amazing. And I can't wait for them to get made so you can see them. But yeah, that was kind of a lot, but <laughs> it was a lot so, of there's so much, too. there's so much. And that's why we do what we do, huh, Tracy? Because it brings us joy. So clear it too. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, well, I'm going to wrap up a little bit. I'm going to fuse a little bit of what I find joy in is this awesome programming and opportunity to do this work. Um, but first, I just want to thank both of you because um, I highly respect you and I also enjoy laughing together with you. So um, I just appreciate you taking time on this Saturday to be with us. Anything for you, Tracy. And we appreciate all that you do as well, you know, not just for Neatera, but for the for the community and for filmmakers. Um, so thank you. And thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks, Tracy. It's always good catching up with you. Yeah, thank you. Um, also, I just want to say a big thanks to all of our teammates and organizers who are behind the scenes. Julie Keck, Michelle Hartubis, Dustin Casper. Um, all the members of Sundance who, you know, actually helped us initiate our fourth world media lab um, in the very beginning. Um, ITVS, uh, who've been uh, with us since the beginning as well. Um, and just the entire Kin Theory team. Um, 
Also, I just want to say thank you to everybody who showed up today for this uh, conversation and who participated in the chat. Um, and then lastly, just a few reminders. For those of you living in Coast Salish territories, um, in the Seattle area tonight, we are screening Beans and Love and Fury at the Shelton Drive-In. It's free. Um, just show up at 6.30. Um, you do need to go online to just download a ticket, but also I think if you show up, you can get in. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe it'll be exciting. Um, lineup tonight. Um, also next weekend, we have some drive-ins too. We'll be showing next Friday, um, uh, uh, Fruits of Labor, as well as the Song of the Butterflies um, at the Oak Harbor drive-in. And then we'll also have a second screening of Beans and Love and Fury in Oak Harbor as well. Um, to learn more about Adam and Ineta, please go to Sundance Institute's Indigenous Program at Sundance.org. And to sign up for the Kin Theory newsletter, go on to kintheory.org, where you'll learn more about our database and upcoming panels. And if you want to know more about Neotero, um, neotero.org, and then uh, enjoy the rest of SIF. And thank you so much. Take care, everybody.